We thank thee for the gift of the Spirit who interprets the word for us and to us, for him who wrote the scriptures. We thank thee for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who has offered the one sacrifice by which we may have forgiveness of sins and justification of life, the presence of the Holy Spirit eternally with us, and all of the other many blessings that are ours as the children of God. How marvelous it is, Lord, to know what we are by thy grace. And we pray that as we study the word this evening that our teacher may be the Spirit, that our hearts may be open, that we may learn, and that we also, by thy grace, may be enabled to live out in our lives the things that we come to know in our minds and in our hearts. We pray for each one present here, for the problems of life which are characteristic of our lives, all of us. We look to thee, Lord, to meet our needs. We want to give thee praise, our great triune God in heaven. And now ask thy presence with us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're turning again to the great epistle to the Hebrews, and for tonight, we're looking at verse 5 through verse 9. So, if you have your New Testaments, turn with me to those verses, and I want to read them, and then we'll seek to give an exposition of them. Now, by way of background, of course, the author of the epistle has pointed out to us in his introduction that God has finally spoken to us in his Son. Actually, in Son. That is a Son-wise revelation. The revelation is not simply what the Son has said, but in who he is and in what he has done. And then to support that, he has turned to the Scriptures and given seven scriptures from the Old Testament to justify the statement that he makes in verse 4 that he is as son better than the angels having obtained an inheritance more excellent than they and a more excellent name than they. And so the texts that we've looked at in some detail are designed to support that conviction that he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. Now for those of you who have been here, you know I've been spent a good bit of time on this and tried to point out that the name, while preeminently is the Son, is not simply the Son, because we have seen in these texts, which in the Old Testament are the texts of the Pentateuch and the Psalms, and the prophets, that in those passages, other names also have been applied to the Son. For example, Lord or Yahweh is applied to the Son. The texts that are used by our author in their Old Testament context refer to Yahweh, but he applies them to the Son of God. And we have seen that another of his names is the name God from Psalm 45. So, Lord, Son, God, Yahweh, these are names that are applicable to the Lord Jesus Christ. We tried also to make this point, which I think is very important, that in order to understand that and not be confused by it, because it would be confusing if we were Unitarian, and we believe that there was one God and one person in the Godhead, we would be very confused. Because how could we call this one person, Yahweh, the Son, or the Father, and not have a contradiction? And we tried to point out that the Christian faith has from almost its beginning believed that there is one God who subsists in three persons, 
and that the term God is applicable to all three of the persons. We say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But the term Lord or Yahweh is also a term that applies to all three persons. We haven't tried to prove that because that would take us astray into systematic theology. But that term Yahweh is applied in the New Testament to all three persons of the Trinity. That is a passage in the Old Testament in which the term Yahweh is used is in the New Testament applied to the first person, the Father, to the second person, the Son, to the third person, the Spirit. And we've seen that in a couple of passages here that the term Lord is or Yahweh is applied to the Son. In the Old Testament context, it's Yahweh. In the New Testament, it's the Son. And so we sought to sum it up by saying we can say Yahweh the Father, Yahweh the Son, Yahweh the Spirit. And in reading the Bible, it's necessary for us to ask the question, which person is this a reference to? That is the text we're looking at. So uh, now we have finished chapter 1 and we looked at the first of the warnings in chapter 2 verse 1 through verse 4 which is a simple statement if in the Old Testament individuals who disobeyed the law of Moses were punished, judged, disciplined as the case may be how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? In other words the salvation that has been given to us through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ being a greater revelation than the revelation of the law, although both come from God, if the former revelation when disobeyed brought judgment, how much more will this more excellent, this greater, this final revelation from God bring in judgment if we disobey it? We pointed out that it first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by those that heard him, and in addition, God bore witness to those who brought the ministry to the, the hearers of the epistle of the Hebrews by giving signs and wonders, gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So our Lord has spoken the truth, the apostles spoke the truth, the apostles gave to others that truth. It has been confirmed to those who have been uh, the recipients of the epistle of the Hebrews. And in addition, they are acquainted with the fact that the Holy Spirit added to the preaching the signs and miracles that further confirm the truth of the, of the Word of God and of the New Testament revelation. Now tonight at verse 5 he continues and he's still thinking about the greatness of the Son of God with reference to the angels because he's been seeking to prove that since he made the statement in chapter 1 and verse 4. Verse 5, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels but one testified in a certain place saying what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection unto his feet. For in that he put all things or all in subjection unto him, he left nothing that is not put unto him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. The subject for tonight is the glorious destiny of man. The space age in which we live has for some time now moved us to ponder anew the ancient questions that are found in the Word of God. For what is your life? 
James asks in the fourth chapter of his letter. What is man? The psalmist asks, and our author has cited the passage from Psalm 8. I remember some years ago when uh, shortly after the Russians had put the first man in space, and when that took place, there was a conversation that was reported by David H.C. Reed, one of the well-known preachers in uh, New York City, a Britisher who had come over to the country and has written a number of books that preachers read filled with uh, interesting sermons. He reports in one of the messages that he gives that shortly after the first Sputnik went into orbit and began to send back the beep beep of people who are now out in space, that he was at a dinner and a lady who was at the dinner party turned to him and said, you ministers can say what you like. Somehow that thing, Sputnik, has gotten between me and God. I think a lot of people probably felt like that. The idea of now man out in space made us wonder, is it really true that the things that the Bible says about the creation, about space, about the world, about us, about the worlds about us, are they really true? Or are they simply the imaginations of common, fallible men like you and me who are so often wrong? Well, man's answers to the questions about himself are as varied as the philosophies and sciences of men. In the encyclopedia, you might read something like this, that man belongs to the phalum chordata, the subphalum vertebrata, ultimately to primates with the monkeys and the apes. And there is sufficient illustration in human life to think that there might be something to that. Uh, uh, in fact, when we see the NFL and some of the things that happen, sometimes the things that happen make me think of the animal world. Philosophers, such as some of those associated with bygone philosophers, have said man is a victim of an impersonal logic of history, a dialectic materialism that drives him like a robot to the ant heap of society, or to the ant heap society. Biologists have said, really, man is a part of nature, an end product of undirected process in evolution, doomed to eventual extension and the cold silence of space. I was uh, a few years back, about 15 years back now, I was, uh, I was, and still am a member of the Book of the Month Club, and one of the books that was advertised in about 1975 was a book called The Biological Time Bomb, Bomb by Gordon Rattray Taylor. And in it, he speaks about some of the things that have interested us and some of the things that interest us now because in the report concerning the book or something of a review of it, uh, the author who writes it says, it's the year 1975 and the prospective, prospective parents of a child have just decided what sex they want their offspring to be. A child to be de developed from an egg fertilized in a test tube. And then the author goes on giving us reason why we should read this book. In the year 2000, another pair of parents are enhancing the intellig intelligence of their unborn child through the oxygenation of the expectant mother's blood. And then it's the year beyond 2000, the reviewer says, and still another set of parents, if that's the word for them, in the case of artificial insemination, have selected from a germ cell bank those qualities they want to see predominant in their child. Moral courage, intellect, supreme athletic ability. All of these things are uh, suggestive of answers to the question, what is man? Can we, by genetic engineering, create the kind of man that we are interested in? It would be interesting to see what kind of people we would create if we really had that power. I wouldn't, I don't think, want to be around. Well, let's get to the point of our text. God has an answer to the question of what is man. His answer is that man is magnificently glorious. 
In fact, man is the crown prince of the earth, the creation's Lord. Listen again what he says. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. Now that can be rendered for a little time. And the New Testament author seems to take that sense, although the Old Testament text seems to take the sense of a little lower. Both are true. A little lower than the angels, but also for a little time lower than the angels. He goes on to say, you have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So this is God's understanding of what man is and what he ultimately will be. He is the Lord of creation. Now, of course, as our author will say, he's not yet serving as that, but that's his destiny. That's what he's going to be. He's the crown prince of the earth. As verse 5 makes it plain, the angels are not, he is. Now, this passage that we're looking at, I'm going to divide it into three parts. And uh, first of all, I want you to notice what the divine intention is in the creation of man according to the author of the epistle. He states in verse 5, and this will take us through the first part of verse 8, that the divine intention is that man is to be the master of the universe. Now remember, there have been three great, or there are three great contrasts in this epistle. The Son is greater than the angels, He's greater than Moses, and then he spends most of his time in proving and expounding and explaining that he's greater than Aaron, the great high priest. This is his great theme, the greatest of the themes that he wants to, to talk about, and I'm looking forward, of course, to the study of that because that's the primary purpose for which this epistle was written. Now he's talking about the Son is greater than the angel, and he said in earlier already now that he's greater than the angels because he's the divine Son, and he's greater than the angels because he, as the Son, is Yahweh, Lord, and in Psalm 45, a text which he has cited, he is also called God. So he is greater than the angels because of these great titles that are given to him. But now, in this part, the second chapter, he will show that he is greater than the angels not because he's Lord, not because he's God, not because he's Yahweh, not because he's the Son of God, but because he's man, ideal man, what man was intended to be. And man was intended to be greater than the angels. So now he's looking at the greatness of the Son of God because he is the genuine man. And that little word for. I've so often said this to people whom I've had the privilege of speaking to, that the greatest words in the Word of God are often the smallest words. They are the little fours, the little therefores, the little for this reason, or on account of this, or even words like now. And we'll see in a moment the word but, the adversative conjunction. Those are the important words. You don't read the Bible to get good feeling. You read the Bible to find the meaning. And you'll best find the meaning when you follow the thought of the author as he argues his points. And this author particularly is a very logical thinker. That is, he thinks in orderly fashion. Now, in the case of some of the Psalms, you don't find that. David at times throws out lots of thoughts, doesn't always connect them, at least in such a way that you can follow him easily. But this author gives us a great deal of help because he says, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. Now the question is, to what does the for refer? 
Well, immediately preceding is the warning, but the warning by its very nature is something of a parenthesis. He's stated a great case that he's greater than the angels, then he's warned us about proper response to it. But now he's starting on another approach to the argument that he's greater than the angels, this time because he's man, and that little four will take us back to verse 14, where he stopped his argumentation. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? They are ministers of the word of God. He is the son of God. And now picking it up after the warning, four, further reason for the greatness of the son of God with respect to the angels, he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. So the four then connects with verse 14. There is a point we need to carefully note. He says he has not put the world to come. There are two words in the New Testament for world, two, two great words. One is cosmos and the other is oikumene. Oikumene is a word that means essentially the inhabited world. Cosmos has a wide variety of meanings but it does not, it can, but it does not by its usage refer to the inhabited world, frequently refers to other things. It can refer to the world in that sense, but when it does, what is underlined is not the inhabitableness of the world, but the order of the world. And so here, the oikomene, the inhabited world, for he has not put the inhabited world to come of which we are speaking in subjection to the angels. Now, has he been speaking about the inhabited world to come? Well, he said in chapter 1, verse 13, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? You mean to say the Son of God has enemies? Of course he has enemies, and these enemies are on the earth. And so here, he has not put the world, the inhabited world to come, of which we speak in subjection to the angels. He's talking about the inhabited world. He's not talking about the present age. He's not talking about the church. He's not talking about the eternal state. He's talking about the kingdom, the kingdom of God, which will come to pass upon the earth. He's already referred to that, remember, in chapter 1, verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, inhabited world, remember? Second Advent, we spent a whole night on verse 6 in dealing with that question, or that question among others with reference to that verse. So this is the inhabited world, and he's saying when the inhabited world to come comes into existence, it's not the angels who are over it, it's the Son himself. He's the one who brings the salvation that is referred to in verse 14. Now, what do you do if you make a statement like this, the Son of God is to be head over the inhabited world? This author likes to prove his points or substantiate his points by reference to Scripture. This is what he does again. He cites from Psalm 8. Now, if you'll turn back there for just a moment, Psalm 8, we'll notice one point before we go on that I think may be of some significance to you. The psalm begins with, O Lord, our Lord, and you'll notice it's a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the avenger. You recognize that as a text our Lord cites. And evidently, he was a study, a student of Psalm 8 also. Now notice verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? I can just imagine David. I'm reading through the Bible. You know I've been telling you that all along. I'm in 2 Samuel. It's been great to go along 
this far, so short a time. I've had some free time to read the Bible, and I've just been reading through the section, beginning of the section on David that we spent about a year expounding a year or two ago here. But I can just imagine David, a shepherd, out on those hills in Judea with his sheep, those times when it was impossible for him to go back in and put them in the place where they belonged. I can imagine him lying down and looking up at the stars in the heavens. And there, under the guidance of God the Holy Spirit, reflecting on the magnificent creation that we see when we lie down on our backs and look above us. When was the last time you did that? Get out in your yard sometime, lie down on your back and look at the heavens and reflect on the greatness of the God who is in heaven. And so doing that, there comes to his mind by the Holy Spirit, what is man that you are mindful of him? Here is his reminiscent of nights under the heavens, the moon, the stars, and he praises God as he reflects upon man's destiny to be over all of the inhabited earth. Dominion is not abrogated by the fall. It still is something God intends for men to have. Sin doesn't cancel that. Sin postpones it. The fall in the Garden of Eden lets us know that those things that are going to be ours are postponed until the sin question is resolved as God intends it to be. But it is going to be the destiny of man. And I would imagine that David, by just being out there, would, it, would have been able to give us a great exposition of the littleness of man of the brevity of man's life, of man's ignorance, of man's powerlessness, and yet in the light of what he knows from Scripture of man's ultimately great authority. If you want to realize how small you are, think of the littleness and the weakness of man in the light of the immensity and the unswerving constancy of the laws of the universe. Compare the length of your life. I think of myself as a person whose life has gone two, maybe three times. That's my life. To this point, as old as I am, it has passed just like that. There are oaks that have lived for a thousand years. Think of the littleness of man. In the light of an oak tree, how limited is man's knowledge in comparison with his illimitable ignorance of the great creation of which we are a part. One of the older commentators has said, how powerless in the grasp of circumstances. If the earth but stirs in her sleep, her cities fall. If the wind blows in its strength, her navies are wrecked. If the invisible seeds of pestilence crowd the air, he must breathe or die, and his science is baffled. Well, we are little, we live a short time, we have truly illimitable ignorance. We are powerless, ultimately. We have, however, authority, and we have a tremendous future. We are no landless kings. We are destined to have authority over the inhabited earth. Isn't that magnificent? Tremendous to think about. Now, the support for this is from Scripture. You know the Navigators. The Navigators is a Christian organization that began in World War II, I believe. Men out on our ships fighting a war, studying the Bible. Out of the Navigators rose an organization that today is still in existence, in which literature uh, 
goes forth, Bible studies are taking place, the work of Christian witness and testimony. The, la the NAVs, as they're called, have often been uh, interested, one of the great interests, I should say, of the NAVs is memorizing scripture. And they have a way to memorize it, a little way in which you memorize scripture. When you have memorized the scriptures, when you say the text, say the verse, then say the text. So you have the origin of the text, the text, and then the origin of the text again. And so you begin everything by John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, etc. John 3.16, twice. Give the location of it. The writer of the epistle of the Hebrews was no nav. Do you notice? One testified in a certain place, saying, he doesn't even tell us where it is. He just says someone, the Greek text says someone has said somewhere. Now, of course, he knows his readers know he's talking about the Bible, but he just loosely says it. So he wouldn't be a very good member of the Navigators. Well, I think they would probably take him in because of what he says, because it's obvious he was knowledgeable of the Word of God because he cites lengthy sections from Jeremiah 31, and he cites them in two places. In fact, he cites them more than one text from it, but he cites them very close to the original text, but they differ, which give you an idea, of course, that he probably had it in his mind, memory. And the slight differences are characterized by the fact that the memory is not perfect, as is the memory of you. So, this is the sport. It's the text of Scripture. Now, having said that, we turn to, and he cites beginning at verse 6, through the first part of verse 8. If you look at your Bible, he doesn't cite all of Psalm 8, but just these verses. And the last words are, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Man's feet. Now, Psalm 8, I started to give an entire message on Psalm 8, but I didn't think that that would be really good for our series. Some of you may give up if uh, we, we don't make a little progress. But Psalm 8 is a lyrical treatment of the creation. In other words, the psalmist, looking back at the creation, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, then puts those great truths to verse, so to speak, to poetry, Hebrew poetry. And so that's what we read here. He's interested, however, in not all of it, but simply the major point of it. And it is this, that God created man and he said to man that you are to rule and have dominion over the face of the earth. And that's the point that he wants to bring out. So he says, you put all things in subjection under his feet, just as God said in Genesis chapter 1, and again repeated it in other places. Now having stated that, having stated, as the psalmist states, that man is God's creation and given authority over the creation, now he's going to talk about the present condition of man and point out that man who has been given authority over everything has been mastered by sin. Sin has come in since Genesis 1. So he says, verse 8, the latter part of it, For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. God is to rule over all of the inhabited earth. But... Notice the last part of verse 8. But now, but now, do we do not yet see all things put under him. G.K. Chesterton once said this, and he was right, I think. Whatever else is or is not true, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he was meant to be. Instead of having the mastery, he is mastered. Instead of ruling, he is enslaved. Instead of being characterized by strength, is characterized by great weakness. Instead of being an ally 
of the Lord God, subject to him, the scriptures tell us that he is a rebel against God. Instead of being characterized by glory, he's characterized by shame. Man seeks his destiny by tyranny and cruelty. There is still something planted within the nature of man that leads him to want to rule. You hear all of our politicians talking about it and all of those who are not yet in office. What do they talk about? What did we hear about over and over again and what are we still hearing about? Through the election and now. Individuals want what? Power. Power. Have you heard that word? Well, of course you've heard it if you've listened to the TV or listened to the radio. Power is what people want. Now that's something God has placed in the nature of man. Power, because that's what he's going to have. Power. But now it's twisted. It's crooked. It's self-serving power. Self-interested power. All the kinds of things that we see in politicians. All the kinds of things we see in businessmen. All the kinds of things, tell it not in Ashkelon, what is it, tell it not, <laughs> publish it not in Ashkelon, lest the uncircumcised Philistines who don't know about preachers uh, might hear, it's in preachers also. They want power. Look at our great denominations. Look at our individual churches. What do people want in the church? Power. It's characteristic of the elders, characteristic of the deacons. It's part of human nature to have power. But now, touched by the wickedness and crookedness of sin, it's self-interest, self-interested power. So, anyway, man seeks his destiny by tyranny and cruelty. Stop talking about those nearest to us husbands, wives. Why is it, do you think, that when Hillary Clinton's name is mentioned, Rush Limbaugh plays Hail to the Chief? <laughs> Why? Why do you think that automatically comes on? If you've never heard it, it's funny. Suddenly you hear it when she, her name is mentioned in the background, Hail to the Chief, is played. It's just his way of pointing out, of course, a lot of people think that she's the power behind the throne. They could probably play that in a lot of our families, too. I've, we don't have too many records that I know of, but if we had that one, I would want to break it, lest it be played when Martha goes to, comes to the fore. <laughs> Might learn where the true power lies. Anyway, look back at history. Pharaoh, Alexander, the Caesars, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Charlemagne, Napoleon, all the way down to our present time, a lust for power which is a faint resemblance of God's original grant of dominion. The Bible's pages are bloody. That's been impressed upon me again as I've been reading through the Bible. It's amazing how bloody they are over and over again, page after page, chapter after chapter, almost verse after verse. Somebody is slaying somebody else. And some of the great men are doing it. The Bible's pages are bloody. Why are they bloody? Because men are violent, that's why. The saddest word in the Bible in one sense is not death, it's not hell, it's not the word lost. The saddest word in the Bible is sin. I think one of the saddest things that I have read in my Bible reading, I just read a night or so ago, when you remember in the latter part of 1 Samuel, when uh, David, or when uh, Saul goes to the witch of Endor and uh, 
has the encounter with the witch of Endor and Samuel is called up and we've talked about that in messages here and I'm just going to say God brought Samuel up and Saul has the conversation with him and in having the conversation with Saul after his life has now become uh, serve in servant service to the sin that characterized his reign Samuel speaks to him and says, Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath among, upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel unto you into the hand of the Philistines. And then I was impressed by this just last night, that Samuel said to Saul and to Marah, you and your sons will be with me. What a terrible thing to hear the prophet say. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Sin. The saddest word in all of the Bible. The Bible is a perfect mirror of the heart. And the greatest exhibition of the Son of Man, of course, is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because there... We see really how wicked men are, religious men. How really, really wicked the human heart is. Do you know about whom I'm speaking? You and me. We are men. We are sinners. The Bible describes us as wicked individuals. We are violent. And if we cover it over with a veneer of our civilization, it's still fundamentally there. So, the present condition of man, mastered by sin, but he's promised dominion. What's the solution? Well, after saying, but now we do not see yet all things put under him, the author goes on to say, but we see Jesus. Look out over the creation, and we do not see things under the authority of the Lord God in heaven, and man serving over this inhabited earth as God's vicegerents. We do not see that. But, he says, we see the Lord Jesus made a little lower than the angels or for a little time lower than the angels on account of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. It's very interesting the words that our author uses. He's used the word see twice in verse 8, the last line or so, and then again in verse 9. These are two different words in the Greek text. One of them means to see with a kind of durative sense. We see and reflect upon it. The other means something like to take a glance. That's probably a little too strong, but it's something like that. It's like a glance. We see as we look out over the world, man is not subject. Well, the creation's not subject to man. Man is not what he is going to be. All things are not yet put under him. But if we take a look up, and see our Lord. What do we see? We see the guarantee that these promises will be ours because he is the great representative. Our next study, we're going to deal with one verse, the 10th verse. That's the point of that 10th verse, that he is the great representative who has represented the people of God and gives them through his work what God has promised them to have and they will ultimately experience it. But we see Jesus. He's the pledge and the guarantee. Luther used to say, our plight is a notus deo windicae dignus, a knot which needs God's help to unravel. How true it is. O oh, loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second atom, we should say the last atom, but our poet says a second atom, to the fight, and to the rescue came. Now, the description is given in two ways. First, 
as a historical event, the coming of our Lord, and then the spiritual significance of it is set forth. He says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. In other words, he retains his human nature. Uh, he is, by incarnation, now one of us, the man, the perfect man, the Lord Jesus, made a little lower than the angels for a time. We see him in this state for the suffering of death, and we see him crowned with glory and honor. It's a look at his whole history. That is, we see him a little lower than the angels, his incarnation, crowned with glory and honor, his exaltation after his death. So made a little lower represents what Arthur Pink used to call that fathomless stoop by which he who was the Son of God, the eternal God, stoops to take human nature to himself, apart from sin, but true, full human nature, and comes down to minister to us. What is interesting so about this to me, and so important, is that when our Lord took human nature to himself, took a man to himself, well, really, like a woman taking a man and a man taking a woman, he took human nature to himself, and he betrothed human nature to himself forever. Forever. Think of it. The eternal son, with all of the glory of the God and all the fullness of it, taking to himself at a point in time human nature becoming what we call the God-man. And thus forever being possessed of our nature. What condescension. What marvelous condescension. So marvelous because we could not be saved otherwise. He cannot be our substitute if he is not one of us. The whole Bible in the Old Testament. Read through Ruth. I read through that not long ago too. Ruth also and the kinsman redeemer sets out that great truth. He must be one of us as well as the eternal God himself to be our substitute and to have the authority and power and strength, saving power to deliver us, the God-man. Now one of us forever. I know you well enough. I've thought about this myself. If I were the second person of the Trinity, would I have taken to myself human nature forever? It's a decision that's forever. It's not for a time. It's forever. Always. The second person of the divine trinity with a human nature. It really is something that we cannot, at least I cannot, fully appreciate what is involved in that. How thankful I am. Betrothed himself to the human race for better, for worse, forever. But now, the last little statement, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, outlines the spiritual significance of it. It's as if he looked at the, what happened historically in a historical way, and now he looks at it in a spiritual way. Let me illustrate in this way. When the Lord Jesus died on Calvary's cross, it would have been possible, of course, for individuals not to realize what was happening. In fact, if you had come around the cross, you might have found a situation like this. You might have approached one man, and you are asking for information, and you ask him, and this happens to be a Jewish man, and you ask this Jewish man, what happened this day in this crucifixion. And he, if he were an unbelieving Jewish man, he would say, a Jewish rebel was crucified this morning. Uh, the second man 
might speak about it in this way. A blaspheming apostate was crucified this morning, getting precisely what he deserved. You might then approach a woman, one of those that followed him out with his cross, and ask her, what happened today? And she might say, a poor, fair, gentle soul was martyred today by wicked men. And then, if you approached a genuine Christian who understood, John came back. They all ran and forsook him. John came back, evidently. If you'd asked John, he might have been able to say, the Son of God died for our sins. You see, in other words, that's the interpretation of what happened. That's why in the Bible we need interpretation, not simply the facts. We need interpretation. And the Bible is the interpretation of many of the great saving events that took place in history. That he by the grace of God might taste death for every man. God has spoken in his Son. We read in verse 1 and 2 and 3, and that he has by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He has tasted death by the grace of God. God has spoken. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. Taste death. There's no indication that it's only a sip. This means the full experience of death, tasted death for every man. Now, I know that some of you know that I happen to be a consistent Calvinist. And so you naturally are wondering, what in the world is he going to say about he's tasted death for every man, for every one? As a matter of fact, it's singular, for every one. I could say to you, well, there is a distinction between uh, the use of terms like all or every or world. You can speak of everyone without exception, and you can speak of everyone without distinction. And all is a term that applies to both of those concepts. All without exception, that is every single individual, or you can say all without distinction, that is Jews and Gentiles. Because everybody is either Jew or Gentile, all without distinction. I could say that settles the question right there, but there's more to it than that. I want you to notice what our author does in this context. He says he tasted death for everyone. Now in verse 10 he talks about bringing many sons to glory. Sons he brings to glory. Verse 11. He talks about those who are sanctified. Verse 12, he calls them my brethren. In verse 13, he calls them the children whom God has given to me. In verse 16, he says, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. This is the everyone of whom he's talking about. Every one of the seed of Abraham, every one of the children, every one of the sanctified, every one of the brethren. But I didn't intend to go into that in detail. That's too much fun to waste on two minutes. So I'll just leave it that way because I know you wanted to say, what will he do with something like that? Well, I study the Bible and uh, we all have fun studying the Bible. We're never going to agree with everything our believing brethren and sisters say. We do need to remember we're in a family of God and it's just like brothers and sisters. And I've got a brother and two sisters and I'm not sure that we've ever agreed on anything all together perfectly harmoniously with the exception of some historic facts like both of our parents are now dead. We agree on that. <laughs> but beyond that, I'm not sure of what we really do agree on. But yet, in general, we agree. <laughs> well, our question was, what is man 
is gloriously answered. Man, although he flung his destiny away. I never have liked that, by the way. This afternoon, I, all, I want to say that the principal parts of fling are fling, flang, and flung. But they're not. It's fling, flung, flung. So he flung. That sounds a little strange to me. But flang <laughs> sounds strange to you. So he flung his destiny away, but he has regained his kingly status in his substitute, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the seed of the woman who has crushed the serpent's head. And through him, we're going to have what God has promised us. There is a marvelous story to me that James Denny talks about. He wrote a letter once to Sir William Robertson Nicoll, great Scottish theologian himself, and he said, I do not believe that the Christian religion, let alone the Christian church, can live unless we can be sure of three things, a real being of God in Christ, the atoning death, and the exaltation of Christ. And then he goes on to say, if Jesus was not in a real sense God manifest in the flesh, God wearing the homespun of our human nature, but only one more fallible man like ourselves, guessing and groping after God, we'd better erase the word gospel from our vocabulary and close our churches. We're no better than the Unitarian preacher who went to Aberdeen and for three days and nights sought to win converts from the down and outs. On the third evening, a fallen woman out of the crowd bluntly told him he'd better pack up and go home. Your rope, she explained, is not long enough for the likes of me. But his rope is long enough. He has offered himself as the atoning sacrifice by which in tasting death, those who lean upon him have the assurance of eternal life and also that they will rule and reign over the, where the inhabited earth to come. We may wonder with the psalmist at man's frailty, yet when we see the Lord Jesus, the second man, we cry from redemption. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall, join in the everlasting song, and crown him Lord of all. Isn't that what you would love to do? Crown him Lord of all. May God give us the grace to stand in him so that we are able to do that. We invite you to come to Christ if you don't know him. Our time is up. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Father, we are so grateful to thee for this marvelous letter written out of the fullness of a man's heart expressing such gratitude for the redemption that our Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. He has tasted death for everyone. We ask thy blessing upon each one present here. May these great truths lift us up and enable us to serve him in our day in a way that will be pleasing to our Lord for Jesus' sake.